The Colorado Buffaloes lost one of their best players, and he's going to be out for a few weeks. What does this do to the team? We're going to talk about that. You are Locked on Buffs, your daily podcast on the Colorado Buffaloes, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked on Buffs. I am your host, Kevin Borba. Today's episode is brought to you by 5-Hour Energy. Go to 5hourenergy.com and use promo code LOCKEDONCFB to receive 20% off your order. We are also brought to you by the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day for free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And joining me today in a little later version of our normal episode because I had some technological issues is the legend, Scott Proctor. Scott, thank you for joining us. (laughs) What's going on, everybody? Kevin, appreciate you having me on as always. My boy, I'm glad we were able to scoot past those technical difficulties of yesterday and get up, get up on the show here. Yeah, we have to do it every week because we talk about everything. We talk about what went wrong in the game before, and we talk about what to expect um, in the next game. And so we're going to just sort of start off with, I would say, probably the one of the bigger storylines from that game which was Shiloh Sanders going down with a forearm injury. Um, He left in the first quarter, tried to tackle Nebraska running back, and it's one of those things where a knee slash leg is usually stronger than other body parts. And so Shiloh's forearm got hit, and he had surgery yesterday, or at least that's when um, Coach Prime posted it. And Coach Prime said he'll be out for two to three weeks, which if you're keeping track at home and looking at the Colorado schedule, that would be the Colorado State game, the Baylor game, and the UCF game if it is, in fact, three weeks. So, Scott, tell me about what you think this does to the defense. Like, who steps up? What are they missing in Shiloh? Yeah, the silver lining is after those three games, as you just mentioned, the Buffs had their first bye week of the season. So, hopefully, that would, you know, theoretically give, you know, kind of Shiloh a, another week to kind of rest up before. I believe that would be that October 12th game against Kansas State at home, which would be a huge game. Um, so hopefully Shiloh's back for that one. But, yeah, this is obviously a big blow for this defense. I mean, obviously Shiloh led this team in tackles last year. So obviously he's a big part of what this defense does schematically. I mean, he plays that free safety position. You know, he's trusted to be kind of that last line of defense. You know, whenever there's a big play, he's kind of that last man to bring down a ball carrier. And, um, you know, obviously he made a huge play. In last year's Rocky Mountain showdown against Colorado State, arguably one of the biggest plays of the game, you know, returning that pick six, um, you know, for a touchdown and whatnot. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be a big blow. Obviously, two to three weeks, you're looking at, you know, a decent chunk of your schedule. On Saturday against Nebraska, when Shadow left the game, it was sophomore defensive back Carter Stoutmire who, you know, subbed in for him. And, you know, he, he, did, a, he did a solid job. I mean, he's been moved around. He played some cornerback um this fall and you know kind of fall camp and look good and obviously he's you know kind of settled back there at safety now i mean this is a the son of a a former nfl pro you know coach prime said today that you know stoutmeyer is a big physical guy can play corner can play safety like i just mentioned and he also mentioned that carter had a couple phenomenal open field tackles on saturday which again that's exactly kind of what Shiloh's specialty is, you know, kind of, again, being that last line of the defense. So look at look for Carter Stoudemire out there, number 23 on the Bucks defense to, you know, kind of, you know, fill in for Shiloh. And it's crazy that it's been two weeks now, two games to start the season, where early in the game the Bucks have lost one of their defensive leaders in that secondary. Obviously, Cameron Silman Craig left early week one against North Dakota State, didn't return to the game. He was back out there in week two against Nebraska and looked like his – normal self led the team in tackles i think he had damn near 11 of them things most of them were solo so he looked back by himself and um coach prime again mentioned today that style you know kind of compliments uh silman craig's game so it's going to be interesting to see how you know that secondary looks this week um they'll be tested because obviously colorado state likes to throw the football um one of their their best player is their receiver tory horton who's you know kind of questionable slash probable to play this week against Colorado, he, you know, had a lower body injury that he suffered in the win over Northern Colorado last week. So his stat is going to be interesting. But also, too, just before we get off this, Shiloh wasn't honestly the, the only big injury for Colorado. Coach Prime also said today that um, running back Dallin Hayden is out for this week, which is a huge blow. I mean, that's somebody who I said last week I wanted to see touch the ball a lot more. He needed to, you know, get the ball in his hands a lot more. So that's going to be a tough blow. Chidoza and Iwanku, they're starting – uh, a defensive tackle 
Um, had an AC joint injury suffered on Saturday. Coach Prime said that he's praying that he's going to be able to be available to go on Saturday, but it doesn't really sound like a sure thing. Um, um, so yeah, there's going to be. It's we're, we're already at that point in the season where injuries, yeah. and, you know, kind of you know reared their ugly heads, and obviously that's the worst part of sports, but they are a part of sports nonetheless. So yeah, it'll yeah. be interesting. We've seen injuries before decimate teams. Um, I've seen. Yeah. Um, teams around the country are plagued by injuries and it's one of those things where it's why depth's important. It's why um, coaching is important. And so we're going to really see whether it's Carter Stottmeyer, um, Savion Riley, who played a little bit in the first game in place of Cameron Sillman Craig, the Vanderbilt slash Miami. He's technically a Miami transfer, I guess. Um, <laughs> Vanderbilt slash Miami. Um, he played a lot. And so it depends on who's going to step up. But realistically, I think Shiloh Sanders, and I'm going to go on a quick little tangent here, Major loss, um, regardless of what his PFF grade has been, um, it's not the best. Regardless of what, like the stats show, he's a vocal mm-hmm. leader. He's a six-year, um, <laughs> six-year safety, six-year college football player. Uh, me and him We're are actually seen a lot of football. Yeah, me and him are the same age. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I literally turned twenty-five tomorrow, and he turns twenty-five. I think in like a couple months. Hey, happy um, early birthday, my boy! Thank you, appreciate it. So it's one of those things where you're losing someone with a lot a ton of experience like let's just look at how many games of football he's played because i'm pulling up his stats right now on espn um he has played oh they don't have it oh that's annoying um we'll go to college football reference but in the meantime in the meantime we also have to think about he's one of the hardest hitting hitters in college football he is someone who led the team in forced fumbles last year obviously he's not a ball hawking safety but he is someone who has sort of coined the the nickname the headache gang ceo of the headache gang right and that's because he hits so damn hard and so when you lose someone who can make a big play who could turn the other team over at any given point that's detrimental to your defense um especially when you're a defense like colorado who needs a big play every once in a while um and of course they don't have all of his jackson state games but just know he's played a lot of college football in his time so it's a tough injury um she doesn't also a very tough injury because I wouldn't say this defensive line has impressed me a lot. Um, I think they've had better moments against the run than they did last year for them yeah. at times, but mm-hmm. I think he'd, he's been the most impressive um, across the board. Um, I would yeah. say BJ yeah. green has had some moments as well, but Chidozi has kind of been the one guy where it's like, okay, I see, I see the vision there. Whereas the rest of the defense line, it's like, eh, I don't know. I don't know what's happening. So they're going to need someone like maybe Anquin Barnes to step up. Um, he's a big body, Quincy Wiggins, whoever it is, someone needs to step up and fill those shoes if he's not able to go. Um, and Colorado, it's going to be an interesting game against Colorado State because they took them to double overtime last year. And realistically, I think they had a decent lead at halftime, if I remember correctly. So yep. it's not a, it's not a just this group of five team that you're going to walk up to and beat them by 30. Like That's just not how Colorado State views this game. That's not how it's going to go. And we're going to talk more about that game when we come back. But at first, a quick little break. This episode of Locked on Buffs is brought to you by our sponsors over at Ultimate Football GM. And let me tell you, if you want to take your own program and take them to glory, this is the perfect game for you. Locked on Buffs fans, I want to give you a moment to give you a heads up about the brand new mobile game that I think you're going to love as much as I do. In this amazing game and simulation, you get to step into the shoes of a head coach and lead your college football program to glory. Could you imagine being the head coach of the Colorado Buffaloes? From recruiting players and hiring coaching staffs to overseeing training camps and handling school scholarships, you control every crucial detail of your program. It's all in your hands. Will be will you be able to handle the pressure? And here's what I really love about the game. You are responsible for calling offensive plays during the game. So where Pat Shermer's struggling, you get to prove if you are the, the right person for the job. Your strategy will not only determine the success of your football season, but it will shape the future and legacy of your program. Ultimate Call Triple Head Coach is completely free, has no ads, and is 100% playable offline. You can play on the go as you want and when you want to. And of course, we have a special locked on. We have a special offer for you, locked on bus fans. Um, use the promo code locked on CFB, all caps, inside the game store to receive a free boost to your program. Make sure to take advantage of this perk as it will get your team off to a strong start. To download the game, just visit ultimate CFB.com or look it up on the app stores. It's Ultimate Call Triple Head Coach. Begin your coaching legacy today. Let's talk about it. It's the Rocky Mountain Showdown. Um, it was, I think this was like Col- Colorado's introduction to college football last year in a way. I don't like, I know we had the TCU game, but this game generated so many viewers. It almost out or outranked 
Texas and Alabama, which at the time I believe was like a top 10 matchup. So two unranked teams from Colorado who typically don't get a lot of attention had like almost 9 million viewers. I think it was like 8.73 um, is the number. And so Crazy. Colorado goes to Fort Collins this time uh, and they are <clears throat> seven and a half, or they're seven point favorites now after the Shiloh Sanders news, uh, which has been updated on ESPN. ESPN gives them an 80.8% chance of winning. What are the keys to victory here? Um, because we're going to talk about the keys. We're going to talk about how this is different from last year. But let's go with the keys first, Scott. Yeah, I mean, we can start offensively. It, it's pretty simple, man. It all starts up front, right? You got to better protect Shador Sanders. You have to give him some clean pockets. You have to give him time to throw. And mm -hmm. when that happens, obviously, Shador Sanders is one of the best quarterbacks in college football, if not the best. Right. Aside from that, again, up front, you have to establish some semblance of a running game. Obviously. It's not ideal that Dallin Hayden, who to me has looked like the best running back on this team so far this season. Um, in, his five, well, in his five carries, yeah. <laughs> right, in his 30-something yards rushing this season, um, <laughs> which is a reflection of the coaching staff, the offensive coaching staff, the guys up front more than it is a reflection of Dallin, Dallin Hayden. But regardless, right. without him, it's going to make things more difficult. So Charlie Arfordal is obviously going to probably get to start again this week. But aside from him, it's going to have to be Michael Welch, um, the true freshman, Isaiah Gusta, the Arkansas transfer. One, if not two, if not all three of those guys have to make their presence felt. There has to be some type of physicality to this offense that just doesn't exist, that has not existed through two weeks. The Colorado Buffalo is offensively, and you can probably say this on both sides of the ball, but they, through two weeks, look like a finesse team. You know, and you play somebody who, like Nebraska, for example, who is the opposite of a finesse team, who is a very physical team, you're going to get results like you got last Saturday. So, obviously, Colorado State doesn't have the physicality, um, you know, the talent that Nebraska does. But I guarantee you, Colorado State, Jay Norvell, head coach of the Rams, is going to be telling his team that that's how they're going to have to play this week. They're going to have to bring the fight to Colorado, specifically Rams yeah. defensively to, you know, Colorado's offense, because again, Colorado hasn't shown much of a running game, much of a physicality to their offensive, you know, identity. And, right. you know, that could get you in trouble if you, again, if you're a finesse team, if you're counting on your quarterback to drop back 40, yeah. 45 times a game, that's going to leave him open to not only turning the ball over, which Shador doesn't typically do, but he's done twice already in two games after only doing it three times last year. It's going to open him up to turnovers. It's going to open him up to, to sacks, to hurries, to the pressures, to getting injured, and that's what you can't have. So yeah, it's going to we, start all up front offensively um, for the Bucks this weekend and for most of the season. Right, and we talked about it on yesterday's episode that didn't work. Um, Shador, <laughs> it felt like as soon as he threw that pick six, the confidence from the team was gone. And so you have to be able to put him into a position where he's confident because he's kind of – the heart and soul of this team. So, and most quarterbacks are, if your quarterback is down in the dumps and yeah. you're an offensive lineman or you're a receiver and you kind of look over at him and he's moping and then you're like, Oh, we're, we're going to lose. And then we talked about the pressure and this, this is how, you know, it got bad. And this is why I did yesterday's episode on being concerned about Colorado and I'm not pressing the panic button, but it is concerning to see the same issues are the same issues from last year. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Shador Sanders was pressured and this is according to Max Olson of ESPN. Shador Sanders was pressured on 22 drop dropbacks versus Nebraska. Five, he went five of 15 passing for 45 yards and a touchdown and was sacked five times. His QBR was a 1.8. And on 19 of those 22 dropbacks, Nebraska only brought three or four people. So it's not even like they were bringing exotic blitzes. They were bringing three or four people, which is the normal, the norm. So mm -hmm. you have to protect Shador Sanders way better. Um, obviously give him time to throw the ball. And because the run game's not a factor. And so if you're going to sell out on throwing the ball, like if that's all you're going to do, you have to do it well. Otherwise, you will lose this game. Defensively, I think it's fairly obvious, Scott, and you could feel free to disagree with me if if, if you feel so inclined, but yeah. you have to protect the middle of the field, right, between the numbers. That's where Colorado has been picked apart the most. Cam Sims, Cam Sims was perfect um, in week one, North Dakota State, that he was between the, between the numbers. And Dylan Raiola, I don't think he was perfect, but he was pretty darn close. Um, he just picked them apart over the middle um, and kind of that's where Colorado's weakness was. And we saw that last year. I believe Colorado State probably called the same four plays last year and they worked every single time, um, which is why that game went into double overtime. So talk to me about what you think the keys are for the defense. 
Yeah, I mean, this goes to the defense as well as the offense and kind of piggybacking off the point that you made from the Nebraska game where it seemed like after the Shador pick six that everything just went downhill. I would argue from the opening drive. Remember, Colorado got the ball first. The first play was a screen, a tunnel screen to Travis Hunter that got knocked down the line of scrimmage. The second play was another screen out to the perimeter of LeJounte Wester that was just flat out dropped. The third play was a sack. That's a, yep. that's a, that's a terrible – and then, of course, Rough Nebraska start. goes down next – next series and goes down the field and scores a touchdown. So, and obviously there was a slow start in week one against North Dakota state. You find yourself losing at halftime, you know, by a field goal, you know, to, to an FCS team, albeit a very good FCS team. So that's the key defensively and offensively as well this week. They have to get off to a fast start. They cannot afford another yeah. slow start and afford that Colorado state crowd, you know, that fan base to get into the game early you know, again, whether they start with the ball or on defense, they have to come out with the right energy, with the right, right. mindset. Because again, it, it, energy it, in general would be great, one hundred percent. Because, like I said, if you allow Colorado State to get some confidence, if you allow that crowd to get into the game, it could turn into a disaster real quickly. And again, that's something they've struggled with through two weeks is getting off to a fast start. So defensively, yeah, they're going to have to get some pressure on BFN, CSU's quarterback. He's prone to throwing that ball away and to giving the defense opportunity. So yeah. uh, obviously, you know, Colorado's defense has this many turnovers through two weeks of football too. So right. that's obviously concerning. Um, you know, whether it's, a, you know, a fumble, forcing a fumble, jumping on a, you know, a fumble or getting a pick, you know, that's gotta happen some at some point this weekend on Saturday for, for the Buffs to feel good about their chances of, you know, winning convincingly, which is something I think they need to do. I don't think, you know, a, a one score win against Colorado State is going to, you know, make a lot of people feel great about the direction of this team. I think Colorado, again, like I mentioned, has to come out from the opening kickoff focus, locked in. And I think they need to get a two, three score win, which is something that they're capable of. You know, when you look at the talent discrepancy, I think that's what they need to do this weekend. But again, it all starts with a fast start, protecting Shador. And then just handling, you know, your business on defense. I don't really, I'm not too worried. Again, I, I like what I've seen defensively out of this team, particularly in the second half of games. Okay. And pretty but much overall, you know, I mean, they, you give up 20 first half points in North Dakota State, and you pretty much shut them out in the second half until two minutes left in the game. You give up 28, really 21 points to Nebraska, they take out that pick six from Shador, and you mm -hmm. shut them out in the second half. I'm, I'm encouraged by what I've seen out of Robert Livingston, the new defensive coordinator. And, you yeah. know, some of those guys on the defensive side of the ball. But it's about starting fast and, you know, again, protecting Shador and establishing some semblance of a running game if such a thing exists under Pat Shermer. It's an enigma. We'll, we'll never know, I think. Um, <laughs> realistically, the fast start thing is absolutely correct. You've hit it on the nail. I had talked about this on yesterday's show. They're 3-9 and nine in the Deion Sanders era, or tenure, if you will, when they're losing at halftime. Um, and so it's one of those yep. things where – if you are down early, they struggle to come back. North Dakota State was one of their – that was their first win of the season, obviously. And the other two wins were against Arizona State and then Colorado State, I believe, was the other one. And so you yeah. want to get off to a better start. You want We've seen Colorado's defense in the second half. You just alluded to it. They're really good in the second half. What What is the difference between doing this in the first half and the second? They need to figure that out. That's a little mm -hmm. soul-searching that they need to do, whether it's a better game plan, whether it's coming out with better energy, like you said. And then offensively – I think, yeah, you mentioned it, and I think this kind of goes hand-in-hand hand with the run game, and a lot of people get upset, and they quote Deion Sanders, who said, you don't need a dominant run game and a dominant passing game, or teams don't have that. And it's like, you're right, most teams don't, but most teams aren't going to have four running back carries in the first half, or whatever the number, like, it was mm -hmm. around there. And so you have to use the run game to your advantage, because a second and six is a lot easier to get than a second and 11, or a second and 12, because you got sacked um, trying to drop back on the first play. So... Yeah, just come out stronger. Come Try to build your own momentum. And I think Colorado, oftentimes, they're so heavily reliant on some sort of big play happening where it's going to, like, save their momentum. And it's like, build your own momentum. Bring your own energy. I believe Dabo Sweeney used to say, bring your own energy um, because it doesn't seem like they're doing that. And then also, this is another talking point about this game, and we'll talk about this a little before we move on. Speaking of bringing your own energy, Colorado State has not given them any ammunition, right? I think we've noticed that Nebraska did the same thing as well. No one is going to give Colorado a talking point, bulletin board material, where it's like, 
hey, they said this about Deion Sanders or, hey, they said this about Shador Sanders. Like, they are not doing that. Jay Norvell has been about as cordial as it seems he gets. Um, he doesn't seem like he's a very um, – I won't say he's not friendly, but he doesn't seem like he's always the most cheerful fella. Um, and then Matt Rule was very complimentary of Colorado. And so Colorado can no longer play this, like, villain role or this, like, hey, they said this about us, so we got to beat them. And so it comes down to how well can you game plan how well can you start the game and can you sort of bounce back if things don't go your way? Would you agree with my assessment of the the coaches? Because both Dion, Coach Prime, excuse me, and Coach Ravel have kind of they they haven't done, they haven't said much. Yeah, I mean they haven't. I mean they're they both learned from their lessons, so to speak, from from last year's debacle and everything that kind of added into you know the game you know surrounding it. Um, but still, I mean, there's plenty of motivation on Colorado's side. I mean, if you remember during the off season in the doldrums of the off season, you know, Jay Norville's wife on Twitter right. called Chador a B word. And obviously yeah. that's something that got back to the Sanders family. Of course, that's something that coach prime was asked about today during his pressure. And he, you know, he said that uh, he actually had the, the, the pleasure of meeting Jay Norville's wife, uh, big 12 meetings um, not too long ago and said that uh, she was delightful, you know, she was a delight. <laughs> she was a delight. You know, he said he wasn't looking for an apology, but you know, he said she was a delight. And he also mentioned, and again, coach prime in this team, they're going to find something, you know, I think, to, to, I think to he has make people, it personal. He has people dedicated to it. <laughs> exactly. To make it personal. I mean, even, even today when coach prime was talking, he said, uh, he said, the gentleman that coaches their team said that, you know, we're the same team as last year. He goes, I'm not going to say that about them. So even in that comment, it's like, yeah, he, he, he feels some type of way about this game right. regardless. You know, Shador does after what happened last year, you know, Travis Hunter does after what yeah. happened last year and anybody who was on that Colorado team still, I'm sure feels some type of way about CSU and they're going to have to use that as fuel again, to come out on fire, to start the game. Do not let CSU, think that they have a chance in this game, honestly, you know, don't let this crowd get into it and think that they have a chance to pull off an upset, you know, right. in their home stadium. That's what you can't do. So um, that's what it's going to come down to. And yeah, the coaches are going to be part of it. Pat Shermer. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to worry about him. I'm starting to think that all the Broncos fans who have told me all off season about, you know, his tenure as the OC in, in Denver with the Broncos all those years ago, I'm, 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 I'm starting to worry about him because Yes, it's only been two weeks, but, you know, to average 37 rushing yards as a team through two yeah. games is completely unacceptable at any level, high school, youth football, college football, NFL, regardless, you name it. That's right. completely unacceptable. So um, it's going to have to change. And again, this uh, this weekend presents a good opportunity for everything that the Buffs need to improve upon for them to do it, for their protection to improve, for their running game to improve. It's all it's all a good opportunity for them to do it against a defense and a team that, you know, on paper, they should be able to move the ball. against. Yeah, it was, it's a little bit concerning. Um, honestly, when you look at the Pat Shermer stuff and you just look at last season when he took over, right? Uh, so the Stanford game with Sean Lewis, they put up 43 points. Granted they lost, but when you spot your defense, a 29 zero lead, you think they'd be able to um, mm -hmm. not give up that many points. Yeah. Uh, UCLA. Yeah, UCLA, that was a tough showing. I think that was the final straw. But they, I think people forget they had one of the best defensive lines in college football. They had um, Latu. First round draft pick, yeah. yeah. They had Latu and then the, the two brothers. I think they were twins um, on the defensive front. And then Pat Shermer comes into the Oregon State game, and they score 19 points. They lose to Arizona. They score 31. Washington State, who was a really bad team, they scored 14 and then Utah, who was, I think, probably the most injured team in college football last year, had they scored 17. That so, was a Ryan Staub. Yeah. yeah, and that was a Ryan Staub game as well. But at the same time, Utah was starting a Juco quarterback who had never played at the D1 level. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's one of those things where Pat Shermer, I think, is coaching for his job a little bit. I don't know what the demotion would be. Um, we've seen that Coach Prime is willing to demote people. Um, I don't know if we're there yet. I think I, think I would need to see five games before I'd be willing to like d entertain that discussion because we we've kind of seen him last year and yeah. we've, we've known about it. So it'd be these interesting. Three, to see. These three weeks are going to tell us everything. Cause again, you yeah. got a game that you should win this weekend. In my opinion, you, by, you open by the big, right. By at least a couple scores, you open the big 12 slate next weekend against Baylor, which again, I think is another winnable game 
assuming right. you take care of business and handle what you need to do. And then you go to Central Florida the week after that, which is probably the Tech. best team out of this three game stretch. But I think Maybe. it's a, it's it's yeah, KJ Jefferson. They got some really good players on both sides of the ball. Really good receiver. Really good running back. All conference type level defensive. Um, linemen, so that's going to be a tough game. But again, on paper, I think it's a it's a it's a winnable game. They mm-hmm. probably won't be favored, but it's a winnable game. And after that, you got the bye week. So these three weeks, you know, are are going to tell us a lot about how you know the the real Big Twelve schedule is going to you know treat this team. And there's there's just got to be improvements on both sides of the ball starting this week. Um, it's not the end of the world. A loss to Nebraska is not the end of the world, although it was mm-hmm. ugly, because I think Nebraska is. I think they're a top 25 team. You know, I think they're they're gonna be they, seven and up by the time they get to Ohio State. <laughs> like Kirk Curb Street teller, right? That's what that's what he said. I know that's what he yeah. said. But, and that wouldn't surprise me. And if that's the case, we're gonna look back, you know, assuming Colorado doesn't completely, you know, implode before then. We're gonna look back at that game. It's like, you know what, they lost to a really good team on the road. And yeah. you know, that happens. But again, it's gonna start this weekend with with a much better showing than what we've seen the last two weeks because we've yet to see this team put together a complete game. And again, this isn't a good opportunity for them to do it. Yeah. I think it, you, you, you hit everything on the head. So I'm just going to add one more thing before we move on. Um, I think the Nebraska game changed how I viewed this Colorado team a little bit um, until they show me that they could play a complete game and they could yeah, come right. out and just be firing on all cylinders. I expect all their games to be close or a lot, a lot closer than expected. Um, so I look at the rest of their schedule, and this isn't there. There isn't like a really need to debate this, but I just think that's how it's going to be. I would say Colorado's mm-hmm. probably going to be favored one time or two more times the rest of the year. Like I would say, Baylor and Cincinnati are probably the only teams I could see them being favored against. And then other than that, yeah, I think they'll probably be slight dogs in all of them. Um, I, or, I agree. Yeah, I agree. So they they have a lot. Of, not that you're trying to prove the odds makers wrong in football, but. That's the odds makers kind of represent how people view your team in a way. Um, and that's not something that players should be looking at. Um, shout out to Iowa, Iowa State's quarterback. Um, but it's something that kind of tells us a lot about you and a lot about how we view your team. And right now, my concern about Colorado is that they haven't shown that they're going to be a lot better. And I think that was the whole notion of this offseason. It was, we're going to be way better in the offense line, the defense line. We brought in these dogs. We brought in all these guys. And it's like, okay, show me that. Right. It's it's one thing to tell me about it. You know what they say? Don't tell me about it. Be about it. So we're, we're waiting for Colorado to be about it. And I think that's going to be um, this Colorado State game in a way is going to be a good litmus test. I said this about Nebraska because I said Nebraska is a good team and we're going to see how good they are against good teams. Now we're going to see how good they are against teams that they should beat by two scores because this isn't even North Dakota State. I think North Dakota State would probably beat Colorado State. Like I think if they went head to head, they'd probably beat them. So now, game, that's for sure. yeah. So now it's like, okay, you should beat this team by two scores. And if you don't, we're going to be in some trouble. Um, when we come back, we're going to be talking about the latest drama around Colorado and their musical choices after touchdowns. <laughs> this episode of Locked on Bus is brought to you by Five Hour Energy. Five Hour Energy fixes tired fast, whether you have a long list to do for work or a list of DIY projects to tackle at home. Take a five hour energy so- shot. So you could check everything off your list um, with zero sugar and a convenient portable size. That's the perfect pick me up for getting stuff done. They have flavors like watermelon, tropical burst, grape, berry, and more. And there's a flavor for everyone. So make sure to try it, them all. If you go to five hour energy and that's the number five hourenergy.com and get some five hour energy product today, you can use my promo code locked on CFB to receive 20% off your order. This offer is only valid until September 30th on one order and cannot be used with other promotions. The code is not good on subscription orders. Go to 5hourenergy.com today. Okay, Scott, it's drama time. Um, <laughs> literally, almost. We're talking about music. We're, we're getting into our <laughs> thespian, area, a thespian era a little bit. So long story short, a radio station, I believe it was, in Colorado, reported that Deion Sanders told the band that they cannot play the fight song after Shador Sanders throws touchdowns because he wants Shador's song perfect timing um, to play after he scores a touchdown. And so this they actually reported it like right after the game on um, this weekend, but it picked up traction yesterday. Like everyone somehow found this report yesterday, it felt like. And so Monday, mm-hmm. it was a big topic of discussion. And then it was like the old Colorado fans were like, oh, he hates tradition. And then the new fans were like, who cares? The son has a rap song. And the students were like, 
we like the song and it's like okay everyone relax and so the school released a statement saying basically and this is me paraphrasing it goes touchdown snippet of the song glory glory colorado and then the fight song plays after the field goal first of all scott you were there in person did you notice the erase the erasure er erasing of the fight song <laughs> honestly no uh, again this is my first year on the beat so that week one game against north dakota state was my first game it was my okay. first colorado football game that i was you know there in person for um i do i do obviously remember hearing perfect timing play for a, a snippet of it play after shador you know through one of his four touchdowns that night yep. or whatever and quite honestly personally in my opinion, <laughs> I loved it. I remember commenting on it during during the game. Right. I'm like, are they playing perfect timing right now? Like, again, I, I, I'm a young guy. I'm tw I just turned 27 years old. I'm a former college quarterback myself, so I have a different perspective than most. That was one of the coolest things like that yeah. I've I've seen at a, at a college football game. Like, and again, I feel like if people just take away the name Shador Sanders, Deion Sanders, or whatever, and this was a uh, say Cam Ward dropped a song this summer. And yeah. he's been he's been obviously he's been playing well that opening game. If you know, I'm sure Miami has a rich tradition of band and their fight song and whatnot. But if he yeah. had a rap song and the Miami athletic department decided to play a snippet of his song after he threw one of his touchdowns, I doubt that we would be hearing about it. And in fact, I feel like most of the college football world would love it. But yeah. because it's Shador Sanders, Deion Sanders, because they're not playing well right now because they're coming off a, a huge loss. Because, again, you mentioned it. This was reported after the Nebraska game, something right. about that had happened the week prior. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So this is not this is not when something no, new. But, I was, like, thinking of the, the game itself, watching them. Like, I don't remember <laughs> what, what played. Like, I, I I don't pay attention. What As someone in Scott gets this as well, when we're covering games, it's exactly. like – we were riding during the game. Like we're up there typing in the mm -hmm. booth. And like we're just chilling. So we go up there. Shador Sanders scores a touchdown. We watch the game. And then um, also we're, we're typing. We're tweeting. Exactly. And stuff. So as soon as plays are over, we're checked out. So honestly, I don't, I don't recall. So, I, so again, I, like I said, I remember hearing perfect timing. And obviously they yeah. explained it because it was cool. It was legitimately cool to me as a football fan. Yeah. Um, and I do. But I remember. And I, that that's true. That statement is true. They play, you know, Glory Glory or the fight song right after that small snippet is played. So it's not like the the, the history of the band of the school is being ignored by Deion Sanders. And again, for that report to come out that Deion Sanders asked the band or told the band not to play the fight song is just yeah. is just not true and just disingenuous. And I think it's just emblematic of a lot of the hate that gets hurled at, you know, Coach Prime, his sons. In this football program, but you know, I yeah. guess that's just that's just part of it. It's also worth noting, and I'm not going to name names, but it's also worth noting that the same area of where the story came out of, um, they did a whole rant on how they're out on Deion Sanders. So um, clearly, there it's are the same outlet, not the same person, but the same outlet. Right, for sure. right, same same neck of the woods. Um, you know, no one had an issue with Jose Iglesias from the New York Mets um, singing his song "OMG" after he hit a walk off. <laughs> you know. That the, the yeah. song that hit the charts, yeah, no one had an issue, but hey, let's let's freak out. Um, realistically, I don't care what songs played, I think everyone can eat, you know. Why we can you? hear, why would you we can hear a snippet, we could hear the band, uh, score a lot of touchdowns, and maybe you can alternate. Who cares? Um, at the end of the day, as long as the band gets their shine too, because obviously they practice and yeah. they work hard. Um, that's not me saying they don't deserve their shine, but there's no need to make this a whole thing, and clearly, it has been turned into a whole thing. and Realistically, we won't find out if the band plays that song until next week. But <laughs> I just know that's not what everyone is saying. The school said that's not true. So and Scott, Coach Prime, Coach Prime addressed it today. You can check out my Twitter right down here below for Coach Prime's full statement on yeah. that erroneous report. You know that was published, and he basically came out and said, among other things, that that's idiotic. Called it so idiotic. Called it idiotic. He said, "Y'all yeah. know that." He said, "As soon as y'all heard that, y'all should have known that that wasn't true." Um, and yeah, I mean, he just talked about the fact that there needs to be some accountability or at least more accountability in, in media space, in, in journalistic, you know, no. you know, enterprises and whatnot. Um, and he's right, partly in that. I think I, I have seen it firsthand where I'm, I see stuff written and ran with and I'm like, that's just not true. 
And whoever wrote that and whoever was the editor who approved that being published should be ashamed of themselves, quite honestly. But that's just kind of the the that's world the of, of you know, click, clickbait. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just kind of what media in, in some factions is kind of devolved yeah. into, which is just unfortunate. Yeah, so we're just going to have to wait and see what song plays when. We're going to have to wait and see how the Bucks do um, this next week. Quick before we go, Scott, score, predi- score prediction and who wins. I haven't really thought about a score prediction. I like to see you to win. Obviously, uh, they have the better quarterback. I think they have them. They have more talent on both sides of the ball. They should win on paper. In terms of a score prediction, uh, I think I think the offense really gets rolling. You know, I'm I'm going to play conservative a bit after what I've seen the last two weeks. Uh, I'm going to go with a I'm going to go with a, a thirty. I'm going to go with the thirty one. 31-21 final, Colorado wins. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm going with a 28-14 um, win. Two touchdown win, but still not high scoring because I don't th- I don't know if this offense is capable of doing that um, in its current way. So we'll just have to wait and see. Scott, thank you for joining us. Make sure to follow him at Scott Proctor on X or Twitter, whatever you want to call it these days. He's got all the coverage. We got all the coverage. And he is here every single week on Lockdown Bus. Appreciate you guys for tuning in. Everyone have a great day, and we will see you tomorrow.